Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to you all. And welcome to the fifth episode of the Space Generation Advisory Council webinar series on health in space. This episode is all about women's health in space. My name is Jules Lancé and my guests of today are Dr. Varsha Yain and Dr. Virginia Watring. Of course, venturing out into deep space will give rise to new challenges, not only to the technologies used, but also to the human element in this type of journey. Our bodies and minds will be put to the test when we travel to Mars on a three-year return journey, or even in the next manned missions to the moon. And just as important as getting there and back, we'll be getting there alive and healthy. At the same time, I just used the word manned missions. Hopefully, we start to see more balanced gender teams in the near future of human exploration missions. And this started in 1963 when Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman in space and more followed, but still the majority of astronauts is male. For one, NASA is planning to put the next man on the moon besides the first woman. Now, space affects some aspects of male and female astronaut physiology differently. For example, on return to Earth, male astronauts have more problems with their vision, whilst female astronauts have more issues with blood pressure measurement. But I won't go into detail, as I'm thrilled that we have two great speakers with us today that know a lot more about this topic. Let me introduce them first shortly, and then I have a little housekeeping announcement, and then we're off with their presentations. So first, we'll be hearing from Dr. Varsha Hyain. After graduating from Imperial College Medical School, Varsha took time out of uh, clinical training to complete a master's degree in space physiology and health at King's College London. And for her master's thesis project, she worked alongside the exploration medical capability team at NASA Johnson Space Center to investigate the efficiencies of the medical systems currently on board the ISS, the International Space Station. And she recently completed an academic clinical fellowship in obstetrics, obstetrics sorry, and gynecology and has extensively studied female health issues related to space flights. And after Varsha, we will hear from Dr. Virginia Watring, having worked at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and with the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. Virginia's research involved examining the changes in physiology and pharmacology that occur in the confined, closed, microgravity and elevated radiation environment of a space mission, ranging from looking at the molecular level to that of the whole human. She is now a resident faculty member of the International Space University at the Human Performance Department. We'll get you to Varsha and Virginia shortly, but first a few housekeeping keeping items. You have been muted upon entry to avoid background noise and disruptions. This session will be recorded for later viewing. And this webinar, as it is a feat of engineering, is not comparable to anything being accomplished in space. However, this is still a global effort with your speakers and moderator being two different time zones already, not counting you, the audience. Of course, we are not counting on any disruptions, but Murphy's Law does apply. So in that case, please bear with us as we try to restore the live session as quickly as possible. And finally, feel free to use the chat box during the presentation for questions and comments. During the Q&A part at the end of this session, I will ask your questions to our speakers. I'd like to remind you that our speakers can't get into personal health questions about astronauts. And also, we won't be taking any clinical questions going into personal health histories of audience members. Other than that, I encourage you to post your questions in the chat box while following the presentations. Now, I have been talking a lot. Let's get to our first speaker, Dr. Varsha Yain. Varsha, thanks for being with us today. I'll be switching over to you now. The virtual floor is yours. Great. Are we up and running? Yes, we are. Go ahead. So let me just put this on presentation view. Lovely. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, so I'd like to thank um, the Space Generation Advisory Committee for this opportunity um, and um, just introduce myself. So my name is Dr. Varsha Jane. I'm an obstetrics and gynaecology doctor in London in the UK and I'm also currently funded by the Wellbeing of Women and a, a clinical research fellow at the MRC Centre for Reproductive Health at the University of Edinburgh. So just to point out, so I have received fellowships in the past um, which have funded part of my travels um, and uh, none of my work has been funded, but the travel has been. I'm currently funded by the Wellbeing of Women, but that is not work related to space medicine. 
I will be discussing the off-label use of the combined oral contraceptive pill, um, and I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So when we're talking about women's health, so Jews has alluded to the fact that not many humans have been into space. So less than 600 humans in total have been into space. And of that, about 11% are women. So we know that about 65 women have been into space, which is not a huge number. So why are we even talking about this? I, think I want my talk to be able to get across that actually gender differences, the impact of sex and gender is important. Um, and we'll go into the reasons why this research is vital. So before we can talk about why this is important, I'd like to just set the scene by giving you a quick overview of the history. So we know that Yuri Gagarin was the first human to go into space in 1957. And at the same time, 13 women were being tested. So they had psychological and physical tests undertaken to see if they could be recruited as astronauts. However, none of them actually did go into space. And that's because military fighter jet test pilot experience was needed and of course, at the time, women weren't allowed to be part of the military. These are the seven astronauts that did get recruited into NASA at the time. So they were known as the Mercury Seven. And as you can see, they pretty much look exactly the same. So you've got the same physique, they're all Caucasian, um, and they look the same. They've got the same military background and experience too. Just to put this into context, at the same time, these are the adverts that women were receiving. So you can see that actually women weren't being perceived in the mindset of being astronauts at the time. So in 1963, as Jules has mentioned, Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman to go into space. But it did take 20 years before NASA put Sally Ride into space. And that's the predominant reason was that we don't we didn't know or there was and wasn't any knowledge about what would happen to the reproductive aspect of women's health. It turns out not, there is nothing different actually happens when women go into space, but that unknown knowledge did create a barrier at the time. Thankfully, since then, NASA have never looked back and recruitment has continued um, to include women at every single stage. This is the class of 2013, and what you'll notice is that it's the first time and only time that we've reached parity in terms of equal numbers of men and women being recruited into the space programme. There's been one more class recruited since then, and they had six women and seven men. And as we know, this year, there was another class of astronauts being recruited. Now, this was a front page of the astronaut selection program um, in March when recruitment was ongoing. And as you can see from the banner at the top, it was all of the active female astronauts that were in the pro that were sort of being advertised. I think what's important to note here is that People always ask me the question, um, well, why are there so few women being recruited? And the simple answer is, well, if there are not enough women applying for the job, how can they be recruited? So the numbers of women going into space purely is a reflection of the number of women applying. And I think this applies not only to the astronaut selection program, but I think in every career as well. So that's something to take forward. So 12,000 people have applied to be part of the astronaut selection program. Um, this year, so we'll see who gets recruited. It's quite exciting. I hope we can reach parity again. So when we talk about the health um, aspects of women going into space, I just want to set a general scene. So we know that the general physiological changes and adaptations that occur pretty much affect every single aspect of the human health system. Um, so immediately the neurovestibular system is affected. So astronauts encounter space motion sickness and they have to understand which way is up, which way is down. Within two weeks to a mile of month, the cardiovascular system and hematological system changes. So the body reaches a new state of being normal in the sense that it reduces the um, amount of fluid volume within the um, body um, red cell mass changes as well so that overall it can cope with this new environment. We know that bone and muscle deteriorate over a much longer period whilst in space and they keep on deteriorating actually. We do have countermeasures in order to reduce that reduction but again that deterioration does still continue despite this. On return back to earth pretty much every single system within the body needs to recover. But we're here to talk about women's health, so let's go into more detail about the gender-based differences. So thankfully, um, in 2014, there was a huge um, effort 
um, to produce this series of six journal articles which looks at the impact of sex and gender in, um, on the adaptation to space. These are widely available and I do suggest if you're interested in the topic to please look them up and have a read. Overall, the findings are summarised within this infographic. Generally, men and women adapt to space in, exact, in pretty much the same way, but there are subtle differences and I want to go through these now with you. So when we look at the behavioural um, side of things, so a study um, which looked at all of the International Space Station astronauts during this period of time, that was including um, American, uh, Russian astronauts, European, Japanese astronauts, approximately 15% were female, 85% were male, so pretty much representative. And we can say that all the astronauts had about the same mission duration. But we are seeing that there were subtle little differences between the male and female astronauts that were being looked at. So generally, women had fewer transits, so fewer space flights compared to men. Men seem to have more military experience. Also, women tended to be slightly younger at first transit. So this is just a figure for long duration space flight, um, whilst men tended to be older. When we look at the psychomotor aspects, there are no differences actually in the male and female astronauts in how they performed. And also sleep, which is so important as well, did not differ between male and female astronauts. Then we want to look at mental health and actually there's no increase in the differences between no increased risk or any differences between depressive or anxiety disorders as may be expected that you see here on earth but that wasn't evident with the astronauts there was also a question as to whether um, female astronauts would experience um, premenstrual dysmorphic syndrome so sort of pms type syndromes but actually that's not the case either there are unknown effects in terms of isolation on the crew or the adaptation of being in space and that seems to be universal between men and women but overall it's generally seen that you sort of need the right stuff to be an astronaut and that's true whether you're a man or a woman in terms of the neurosensory system what we do know so we've already mentioned before that there are in the laboratory no differences between motion sickness in men and women however we do note that women tend to have more entry motion sickness so when they go into space that space motion sickness is there more in women however men seem to have more re-entry motion sickness so when they come back to earth also another bizarre phenomenon which they've we've not been able to explain is that male astronauts tend to have more of a hearing loss in their left ear more so than their right and actually this loss is not experienced by the female astronauts studies have been done in order to look at the equipment or the headphones that the astronauts are using to see if they can detect a difference but actually that's not there so this is another it just leads to more questions as to why is this happening now in terms of the immune system we know that uh, females just generally here on earth are more susceptible to radiation based cancers and so for this reason the number of days a male and female astronaut is allowed to go into space is very tightly regulated and generally female astronauts have less number of days in space compared to men this is not always the case as we know Peggy Whitson holds um, a brilliant record of the most number of days in space um, after Russian astronaut but what we do know in terms of um, female response to viruses or bacteria is that women tend to mount a much greater immune response this also puts women at risk of more um, autoimmune conditions here on Earth. And so we would assume that that would be the same that happens in space. However, there's actually not that much of a difference in space. So if male or female astronauts were to encounter um, any viruses or bacteria, we don't suspect that there would be a difference. In terms of the cardiovascular system, um, there's a thought process that, that there's a, a cephalic fluid shift um, of the body's uh, fluids and then the baroreceptors kick in and whilst uh, the astronaut is reached has gone into space the astronaut reaches a uvolemic state so a reduced amount of plasma volume within the body and then when we get back to uh, when the astronaut gets back to earth they need to make, build that back up again but for reasons um, that are listed in the box on the left hand side female astronauts are actually more susceptible to orthostatic intolerance when they come back to earth so they're shorter there's differences in the vascular resistance within the body and so they tend to drop that essentially tend to drop their blood pressure 
because they're not able to maintain that blood pressure when they come back into the 1G environment. Now there is a syndrome um, called space flight associated neuroocular syndrome and this is quite interesting because it tends to affect men more so than women and the condition is also much more severe in men compared to women. So this is a condition where you get optic disc edema, you get globe flattening, um, distension of the optic nerve sheath. Um, so all these signs essentially reduce um, visual impairment, so significantly impact visual impairment when astronauts get back to Earth. And unfortunately, there have not been any studies or any discoveries found that can actually completely reverse this when astronauts get back. Female astronauts tend to have much milder symptoms compared to male astronauts. And it's not known why, but the um, hypothesis is that it could be to do with um, higher vascular compliance, the fact that the female astronauts are actually just a little bit younger than the male astronauts, and it could potentially be due to the hormonal milieu. So, for example, the differences in sex, in sex steroid hormones um, in the female astronauts versus the men. Now we talk about musculoskeletal health. So muscle and bone mass reduces as the astronauts are in space. We do have countermeasures, for example, the exercises device, the exercise devices that are on space station, um, and that does help that help reduce the reduction in bone and muscle mass when astronauts go into space. And overall, we found that that reduction is pretty similar as a whole in men and women. But we do note that in female astronauts, you get a reduction in the muscle volume and more so in the fast type 2 fibres compared to type 1 fibres um, compared to the male astronauts but actually the slow type fibres reduce just as a general blanket rule anyway in male and female astronauts. I wanted to use this point also to highlight that there are it's very difficult to tease out differences um, between the male and female astronauts in musculoskeletal health for one other reason and that is because um, there isn't much data out there so with the number of astronauts that have gone into space, there's very few female um, astronauts that are then um, having their data being put forward for studies. And so I think this also highlights another important point that when we are doing research here on Earth, to make sure that there's an equal representation of men and women so you can actually tease out these gender differences. So if we go on to the um, aspect of researching women's health in particular, so we want to talk about the reproductive aspects. I've already talked about the fact that actually the menstrual cycle doesn't change when the human body goes into space. But when we talk about the menstrual cycle, I like to give a little overview because it can sometimes be quite a while since people have sort of really looked into this. So there's two stages of the, of the normal menstrual cycle. The proliferative stage, which is the first half, and the secretory stage, which is the second half. Um, these are essentially um, dominated by various form sex steroid hormones, mainly estrogen and progesterone. And so this is related to um, the follicle that's released from the ovary, um, which then becomes the corpus luteum. The endometrium, so that's the lining of the womb, um, is primed and ready to receive a fertilized egg in the secretory phase. However, when that's not happening, there is a progesterone withdrawal um, and you, it leads to menstruation. So let's talk about the astronauts. So there are no rules and regulations at NASA to say that uh, astronauts do or should, should or should not have a period in space. It's completely personal choice. But what there are rules about is that pregnancy is completely contraindicated for pre-flight training activities and also for space flight. Now, if female astronauts are going to make the choice to suppress menstruation, they might want to consider a few things. So there are onboard re restrictions which might, might um, uh, change their decision. So that's, for example, the space toilet um, and also the fact that managing sanitary products in that environment might be a little bit more tricky. And finally, compliance issues as well. For example, in the pre-training um, times, they might have lo multiple long-haul flights or even when they're in space, taking pills every single day. But if they were to do this, they would probably want the minimal amount of breakthrough bleeding because that's, we know that blood cannot be handled by the toilets on board the ISS. And so that urine is then wasted as opposed to being recycled. And also they would need effective contraception. So when I was looking into this topic, I wanted to know if there were any analogue populations that we could look into. 
And I found that there was a study with military personnel. So this paper was published in 2011 and it questioned um, frontline female military personnel. 66% of deployed frontline female per personnel desired menstrual suppression, but interestingly, only 21% reported use. And that was predominantly because they felt more education was needed about the matter. Also, the flight surgeons within the military felt that the GPs were talking about menstrual suppression and the GPs thought that the flight surgeons were. So actually, it just highlighted that more discussion and education is needed about this topic. Now NASA have a number of years of experience of um, using the combined oral contraceptive pill in order to um, uh, lead to menstrual suppression in the female astronauts. The pill contains two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and it successfully leads to the fact that you don't get these dominant phases of different hormones within the menstrual cycle. The endometrium doesn't build up, so you get a very thin endometrium. Eventually, if the pill is taken back to back, um, you get periods of time where you might get some breakthrough bleeding, but eventually you don't get any breakthrough bleeding at all. And this is safe in the astronaut population. But I wanted to understand if there were other aspects that can, other treatments that can be used for menstrual suppression. So nowadays we have long acting reversible contraceptive agents, and these are progestin only um, agents. So there's no estrogen component of them. We looked into the etonogestrel, which is a type of progestin implant, and the levonogestrel, a different type of progestin intrauterine device. Both are long acting, so the etonogestrel implant lasts for three years, the IUD can last for five, and they were both seemed as viable options um, for menstrual suppression. So just wanted to give the astronaut more options. And this is part of the paper that was published in 2016, which can be read in more detail offline. But essentially looking into when you're giving options to astronauts, you want to be looking at the advantages and disadvantages specifically for them. So I needed to look at the um, operational side of things. What would have an Im would it have an impact when they were doing um, extravehicular activity? Would it change things when they were diving? So those sorts of questions would come up and that's what I needed to look into. Essentially, the long and short of it is that they are viable options. And so actually the female astronauts have got more of a choice if they want to choose these options. But this led to a very interesting question being posed around about 2013 when I met Dr. Wattring. So the question was, what, which um, menstrual suppression agent or really which contraceptive pill could be used to provide the lowest risk of venous thromboembolism? At the time, um, obviously, no venous thromboembolism had been reported. So this was all hypothetical, but we really wanted to reduce that risk because venous thromboembolism is a known side effect of the combined contraceptive pill. So let's just recap about venous thromboembolism. So VTEs or venous thromboembolisms are blood clots. So you've got a nice magnified picture here with the blood cells and also lots of fibrin deposition. The reason why they occur is really mainly surrounded um, with Verkhoff's triad. So blood stasis, where blood doesn't move very well through the um, body. Hypercoagulability, where you've got an increased likelihood of that blood clotting. And also endothelial damage, where you've got damage to the, blood cell, to the cells of the vessels that carry the blood. So when you've got all three of these, it's sort of a perfect storm for a VTE to develop. Now VTEs, um, clinically, um, you would tend to get them either in the lower limbs, that would be a deep vein thrombosis, where you might have pain in the calves, redness or swelling, um, or it could move towards the lungs, where that's called a pulmonary embolism, and you could have difficulty breathing, a change in the heart rate. And the risk is that they could travel up to the brain, cause a stroke or may even be fatal. Um, venous thromboembolism, important to remember, are they are preventable and treatable. They cost billions of dollars um, in the US, and it's estimated that one in a thousand people in the US will suffer from a VTE. But what's also important to remember is that they are preventable. So clinically, when I was, if I were to look at a patient and try and understand their risks for venous thromboembolism, I'd essentially be looking at risk calculators, which we use in the clinic. Now, these aren't really applicable to astronauts because we know that they're fit and healthy. We know that a lot of these things are screened out during the selection process. But when we look a little bit deeper, some of these factors might apply. 
they are getting older. For example, they're in their 40s when they're doing long duration flights. They're not that mobile when they're in space. There's multiple times where they um, have long haul travel. And also the female astronauts are using the combined contraceptive pill. So at the time when we were doing this uh, research, there was no venous thromboembolism reported pre, during or post flight. And so this was all hypothetical. So I wanted to attack the question in, in a way that I would do with any clinical question. So what is my population at risk at? So the female astronauts were using the combined contraceptive pill. Yes, there is a level of the estrogen component being more risky for developing a blood clot, but generally female astronauts are using 30 to 35 micrograms of estradiol, which is um, a low risk for developing a clot. Um, the type of progestin is also important, but generally the progestin type was quite safe for the astronauts. The astronauts are having episodes of multiple long haul travel and any journey of four hours or more increases the risk by 25%. So that was significant. Now we know that the average age of an ASCAM finalist, so an astronaut candidate finalist is 32 years. And the average age of first flight for a female astronaut, this is um, including short duration flights, the data we have is 38 years. Um, so, and every decade of life, there's an increased risk by two to six fold of venous thromboembolism. So that also increases when um, astronauts doing long duration flight in their 40s. Astronauts are generally not immobile, they're quite active people. However, there are points and times in their, in their training where they might be inactive. This could come into play, for example, during Soyuz training, um, where they've got to have multiple hours within the bucket seats, and they could um, that could lead to points within their blood system where damage might occur, or they might get um, points of stagnation of blood, and therefore blood clots might develop. Um, and there might also be times when astronauts are in space, they're really only exercising for one hour a day. And so again, it's relative immobility compared to normal. And astronauts being active also have very um, activity-based hobbies. And so there is a risk of muscle injury. So we know from um, a ligament tear, the odds ratio of a blood clot to, increase, uh, to develop is actually 10 times higher than normal. So that's also a potential risk. And finally, it comes up the question about decompression sickness. So the astronauts don't tend to get decompression sickness. Female astronauts don't tend to get decompression sickness more than male astronauts. Um, and generally that's the case in the general population as well. However, there is the uh, potential that when the astronauts are doing um, diving episodes in the neutral buoyancy lab, for example, microbubbles might form within the blood system. Now, microbubbles tend to be very prothrombotic, so they've got a very sticky surface. So again, these might be a focus for where blood clots can develop. Now, in terms of what happened during our study, I'll let Dr. Watering um, go over the research aspects but I wanted to provide that clinical side of things. So now what we do know is that there has been an episode of venous thromboembolism that was reported earlier this year. Um, but again, Dr. Watering will go over that in much more detail. So I'm going to end my talk here. I just wanted to say thank you to all of the organisations that have been, been involved and are involved in my work. Um, and also mainly thanks to um, NASA's LSAH programme, who have provided all of the data for the research that Dr. Watring and I have done. Thank you so much, Varsha. I'm going to pull up my slides now. Let's talk about the research side of things. But first, let me tell you who I am. I used to run pharmacology research at Johnson Space Center. And while I was there, I had experiences working with the uh, clinicians who take care of the astronauts every day before they go on their flights, while they're training, and uh, while they're on their missions. So I learned a lot about the needs of the astronauts and the physiological stressors on the astronauts. And I also learned a lot about the kinds of research that gets conducted on astronauts. And this is one example. This paper was published in uh, November of last year by my friend Karina Marshall Goebel at Johnson Space Center. This group is based at JSC and they were studying that SANS phenomenon that Varsha mentioned. Uh, we think it's fluid uh, shifting to the head. Uh, it manifests as changes in vision. And for some astronauts, this, uh, these changes don't correct uh, 
when someone returns to earth they may these changes may persist and that's that's uh not good so we want to understand what's going on and figure out how to prevent it or reverse it and this study is an is uh one of many aimed at understanding those fluid shifts and they were conducting ultrasounds on the on the neck to to see if vessels distended or shrunk during flight compared to on the ground and as these studies were being conducted there were a couple of really surprising things that came out and one was that in some people they saw no blood flow when there should have been drainage from the head blood was pretty much sitting still and in a few people just a couple of people there was reverse flow in a vein that should have been carrying fluid away from the brain back to the heart they saw fluid moving toward the the brain the reverse direction now we don't really know the medical consequences of this whether it was on both sides or one side or does this happen in microgravity with any frequency uh, we don't completely understand but on earth we know that when there is a situation of no blood flow that is setting up circumstances to be ripe for causing a, a blood clot uh, a venous thromboembolism now this study um, showed that these changes in blood flow occurred um, during flight whether or not the individuals were using lower lower body negative pressure lower body negative pressure corrected the situation a bit but not completely individuals tended to recover after flight show normal normal vessel sizes after their missions and they had returned to earth there are videos associated with the web page for this paper i urge you to go look at those they are really interesting if you can call it interesting looking at blood not moving um, it's it's not what you should see and um, again we don't know how frequent this is this is something that comes up pretty often when we're studying astronauts in flight we we can measure something in a in a laboratory kind of way we've got really good techniques at measuring things we can see things we don't always know if they are clinically relevant and this is one of those cases uh, we only had 11 subjects in this study and nine of them were men so there just weren't enough female subjects to determine if one sex was affected differently than the other we know that these kinds of uh, studies will continue this is a really compelling if not somewhat alarming result. And this was just last November. This is hot off the presses kind of work. Now, moving forward in time just a little bit in January, um, Varsha had mentioned that when we were doing our initial studies, there had been no reports of a venous thromboembolism occurring during spaceflight. Well, in January, we had that first report. So one individual reported having a TE, and that individual was a subject in the fluid shift study. The, the clot was found during uh, the scanning conducted for this study. The, the individual was asymptomatic and apparently not troubled by this clot at all. However, uh, because of the significant medical finding, uh, this individual was pulled out of the study given advanced uh, scanning and other diagnostics and started on some therapies to uh, break up the clot the individual recovered spontaneously after returning to earth we don't know at this point if this has ever happened before maybe it it does occur more often maybe it does not maybe this was the really the first time we just don't know but I think we can be sure that investigators are going to keep looking and part of why they're going to keep looking is because this is such a significant cardiovascular issue a lot of lay people don't um, recognize that VTEs are the third most common cardiovascular issue 
right behind heart attacks and stroke. Um, and they are potentially deadly and they cost uh, the economy a tremendous amount of money. This 15.5 billion per year in the United States, that is almost as much as the NASA budget every year. Um, it's, a, it's a significant amount of money. And because these are significant and we've known about them for some time, we know a lot about the risk factors associated with VTE. And we know that use of combined oral contraceptives doubles the risk. Now, Varsha mentioned when we first started working together, uh, we met at an asthma meeting, Aerospace Medicine Association annual meeting. She tracked me down and told me she was interested in doing some women's health studies. This is when I was at JSC. And it turns out that I had, um, I had heard from a flight surgeon who had asked me um, some months earlier a question that I thought was really bizarre. Uh, he called me and he asked, uh, what, what oral contraceptive pill should I put an astronaut on if I want to make sure to minimize the risk of VTE? And I thought that was a, a kind of a ridiculous question. You know, if you have a patient with any significant risk of VTE, you don't put them on a combined oral contraceptive pill. You find some other birth control mechanism for them. Uh, that question almost didn't compute for me. But once I had an expert, a clinical expert like Varsha, who was willing to work on this question with me, we then had the expertise between the two of us to attack this question. Uh, what would be the best uh, strategy for FEMA astronauts to use? Yes, menstrual suppression is considered desirable by a lot of the astronauts, but it's their choice and they can choose to use a combined oral contraceptive pill back to back. They can choose to use an implant in the arm or an IUD, or they can choose to have ordinary uh, menstrual cycles and have their periods in space. Varsha mentioned that education is an important point, and I, I couldn't agree more. When we first started discussing these questions, some of the female astronauts approached Varsha and, and wanted her input on, on what they should do and how they should do it and, and asked for extra education. And I think there are probably a lot of women even on Earth who want to know more about this. So as Varsha mentioned, we evaluated the various known risk factors for VTE and focused on a few that were more important for the astronaut corps than others. Uh, we could easily rule out quite a few of these things, but not age or uh, periods of Im Im immobility uh, often associated with long haul travel. The astronauts during training are often on an international flight one week per month, they go somewhere. They go to uh, Japan to train with JAXA. They go to Russia to train. Uh, they go to Canada to train on the robotics. They go back to Johnson Space Center. About one week a month they spend um, on long haul travel. Some of the uh, risk factors were things that we could investigate if we had a little bit of data from uh, various blood tests and even uh, nutritional measurements. And as we were coming up with the first paper that we put out in 2016, we realized that NASA might already have some data, uh, not exactly what we wanted, but close to it. So we started asking them, we started asking NASA, what data do you have on female astronauts that you could share with us that would help us evaluate the actual risk um, the actual risk of the female astronauts in flight. And we put together a relatively unique kind of a study. We worked very closely with a couple of in-house um, NASA biostatisticians, that's uh, Platt Snyder and Young, and with a woman from the uh, longitudinal health group at Johnson Space Center. These are the folks who are in charge of all the medical data. We uh, eventually got hold of data from 38 female astronaut flights. So that's, that's about half of all the women who've ever flown to space. 
uh, we were granted data from. And that's analyzed in the paper that we published uh, just last month. Now, some of the measures that we got were from routine blood tests, tests that were conducted um, on a calendar basis to check on, on astronaut health. So the N numbers for most of these were relatively high. And uh, others were taken from research studies looking at nutrition and those numbers are significantly lower because not all astronauts had signed up for these nutritional research studies. So this first figure I'm showing you has B12 and iron and transparent, TIBC, uh, ferritin and folate. These are from mostly the nutrition studies. Uh, we have data collected at the at a pre-flight time point as close as we could get it to before the mission and a post-flight time point as close as we could get it after the mission. And what you see here is uh, the, the little dashed lines indicate clinical norms. So inside this range is considered normal and healthy. And you see that most of the data fall into those ranges. There are just a couple of points that are outside the ranges. And in general, you don't see a significant trend. It's, it's as if the stressor of spaceflight doesn't really change these measures much. Uh, because we had a relatively high end in some of these, we did detect statistical differences. Uh, B12 is down a little bit, transferrin, iron, and folate all down just a little bit. Uh, we don't think that they're down enough to be um, actually relevant in a clinical uh, sense. And we don't have enough individuals who were non-users of combined oral contraceptives to make very many meaningful statements about differences between the COC users and the COC non-users. When it comes to the, the hematological risk factors that we could get from these retrospective data that had been collected for other purposes, we see, again, this is presented exactly the same way, pre-flight, post-flight on the right, and the, the dashed lines indicate clinical norms. Most of the data points are within the clinical norms, and you don't see much of a change between pre-flight and post-flight. In this case, there's a small change that's st statistically significant in hemoglobin and hematocrit. But again, and that's, Interestingly enough, here we do have statistical power. That's among the COC users compared to the non-users. Um, that may just be reflective of less blood loss uh, due to menstruation during the flight. So this is the, the picture that we have now. And honestly, we were surprised to be able to get so much data uh, from so many women on so many flights. And I'm really... Uh, thankful to Johnson Space Center's LSAH group for granting us use of the data and for the biostatistician uh, that helped us analyze these data uh, the best way that we possibly could. We found um, that we were missing the measures we wanted most and those are, are listed in the paper as recommendations for the future. We, we'd be interested in some more meaningful time points. In some cases, the, the uh, sampling and measurement closest to mission was uh, a few months away, and, and a time point closer to a mission would have been much better. Even better, of course, would be a time point during the mission or multiple time points during a mission to get a better picture of what's going on in flight. Um, it would still be useful to get more subjects with known medication use histories. The data we were granted use were all de-identified. We can't associate any individual in those data uh, with a particular oral contraceptive pill or other suppression method. We just know if they were using COCs or not. And those were uh, done to protect the privacy of the astronaut subjects. I think we've also demonstrated in our study and in the uh, Marshall Gopal study, the, the flight fluid shift study, we've demonstrated that useful data can come from seemingly unrelated work. 
I think it's a really good idea to look at a data set from a few points of view and, and try and extract everything you can out of it. And we know that the data that we're, uh, the results, the conclusions we're coming up with can be used to inform better design of new research studies. So I have every confidence that what we've published recently is going to be used by NASA to help design new women's health studies going forward in the future. We all know that more women will be going to space. And we want to make sure that, that the flight surgeons who are treating them and those female astronauts have good information about what to expect when they go to flight and and um, how their medical care should proceed to to uh, protect their health as as well as we possibly can you know that's something we owe to all the astronauts so with that uh jules i think we'll wrap it up and shall we address some questions we will but first let me thank you and varsha for this very comprehensive uh, talk uh, thanks for being with us uh, in the beginning, but also showing us all the data and the latest um, insights of uh, your studies, actually a very recent study uh, included. Um, this brings us to the Q&A part of our episode. I turn to the audience now. This is your chance to engage with uh, Varsha and Virginia by putting your questions in the chat box uh, to the right of your screen. I'll try to moderate these. Um, a lot of you have already been posting questions. Um, for example, um, you mentioned, uh, Varsha, you mentioned already a comparison with an analog environment, but uh, Yulia Akisheva is asking, uh, I would like to know how women's health can be studied uh, through analog missions for later utilization of the results in space. What could we focus on in analog missions? Do you have some thoughts on that? I think the most important thing is representation. So um, when analog missions are running on Earth, so where, however that may be, whether that's bed rest studies um, or certain sort of other ways of, of studying these things, I think representation is important. So making sure from the beginning when you're putting in your ethics application that you're including that gender question because then you can tease it out. So as um, Dr. Wattring mentioned, um, with the blood flow study, there were only two women that were part of that study. So it's impossible to tease out that gender related question um, from that. And it's sort of an after, it becomes an afterthought, um, gender does. Um, and so I think as scientists and as researchers, we really need to have that representation from the beginning. The other thing, being an obstetrician gynecologist, I would always say if you can collect data on the menstrual cycle and also any hormonal use, that provides an invaluable amount of information when you then do look at your data. Um, so I think that's particularly important because I think that um, is then the starting point for further um, analysis later on down the line. All right. Excellent. I'd like to add. Um... The, the questioner was probably asking about uh, human analogs of spaceflight. Mm -hmm. This equality and representation pro should probably also happen with animal studies and even cell-based studies. We, we know now that using cells from men versus cells from women can result different, different results and conclusions in various kinds of studies. So that e equality and representation matters for all kinds of different science. Excellent. All right. Thanks. Um, she had one other question on the applicability of, uh, of findings. Can we bring the results of studies from space back to Earth and use them for the benefit of people living on Earth uh, with regard to this particular topic? Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. So through um, from Varsh's first efforts in this area, we realized a lot of parallels with women um, deployed on on military missions women doing field work in various kinds of applications there are a lot of women on earth who would benefit from knowing more about how menstrual suppression works what it can do to them uh, to be assured about its safety and and um uh, and just that it's available a surprising number of women don't realize that this is a, an available option mm -hmm. I think, um, so if I take that further as well, so I think um, learning what I've learned from space 
medicine or the field of space medicine is that there's a huge amount of technology and advances that happens within the space field. Um, one particular thing being precision medicine, and we see that a lot with the cancer research that's coming out now. My career has definitely gone in the direction, well, if precision medicine can help astronauts, can precision medicine help every single gynecological patient that I see? So I think it's, there's a huge amount of applicability, and I think all of the work that we do in space, you should always be asking the question, how can I affect my population here on Earth? Because ultimately, that's what matters. We've got to keep everyone healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes, great, thanks. So another question from Andrea Jimenez Fernandez. She's asking, are there any particular changes in some potential biomarkers that might predict future illnesses when it comes to women's health? We don't know yet, but that would be really, really useful, wouldn't it? I, I think that, that, that also comes down to, um, in order to be able to detect biomarkers, you need enough people recruited into studies. Mm -hmm. So that just, it comes back to the same thing. Yes, I get, I get it. Um, a question from Lauren Church. How do you foresee contraceptives or birth control being utilized in long-term habitations, like when going to the moon or Mars? Do you want me to talk? I can talk about it from a clinical aspect. Please do. If you have any <laughs> so radiation is a very serious threat in space. And so in terms of, um, I always get asked the question about pregnancy. So pregnancy would not be safe because radiation would have an impact on the growing embryo and fetus um, in a negative way. So I think therefore contraception would be important there. But also every single gram of mass that's sent into space costs money. And so um, it may be a choice that the astronauts or the future humans that travel outside of our Earth planet's orbit decide that actually dealing with menstruation may not be for them and so menstrual suppression may be an option. Hence, co the contraceptive agents that are being used would potentially be beneficial at that point. I think mm -hmm. there was a lot of research that needs to be done before we use contraceptive agents for contraception as opposed to their additional benefits first. And there's another additional benefit and it's one that we uh, recommend in our papers. Um, a small amount of estrogen can help preserve bone mineral density. So for people who are living in a low gravity situation, it might be very useful to supplement estrogen just a little bit and help preserve their bone. All right. Thanks. So with giving answers to these questions, you've already went into quite some other questions and people are really complimenting all of you on uh, both of you on your talks. Um, I guess since we're almost running out of time, one final question coming from Miles Harris to both speakers. What advice do you have for someone interested in doing some postdoctoral research in space health? And he's thanking you for your great presentations and interesting findings. Well, um, you need to find someone to work with to do your postdoc in space health. Uh, there are a number of, of uh, clinical people as well as researchers like me around the world doing research on space health. Read papers and make contact with those authors and, and see what you can work out. Uh, this is essentially how Varsha wound up working at NASA just under her own initiative. Um, this is, it works. It works. Read the papers and, and make some contacts. I would just say, yeah, absolutely. Um, do all of that. Know what you're talking about. Know what your question is going to be if you do want to do research. Um, have an area that you want to work in, but specifically know what change you want to affect. Um, and then the other thing for me, I would just say is don't give up. So it was a very long <laughs> journey before I actually met Dr. Watching. Um, and I can tell you the whole of that week at asthma, I got told to go away because women's health would never be an area that was researched into. And I met Dr. Wattring, who was doing the last session on the last day of a four-day conference right. halfway right. across the world. So um, putting yourself out there and never giving up is really important. Someone else might Barsha, not believe you, but you've got to believe in yourself. Should we then say how many years it took to get permission to get you on site at JSC? 
or no. No, it was yeah. easy. The paperwork was easy. I'll leave that up. Great. Great advice. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. We, we are at the top of the hour, which means that we have to conclude this fifth episode of the Health in Space series. I'd like to give many thanks to our speakers, Varsha and Virginia, for being with us today. The presentations you gave us were inspiring and gave us a good look into the now and future medical aspects of human space travel. And thanks for taking the time. If you, the audience, liked this episode, check out the SGAC YouTube channel for more previous episodes and other materials. As for the Health in Space series, this was our fifth session, but we are evaluating new topics for new episodes. We have a whole list of fascinating topics that come to mind when thinking about health in space. But if you have a topic that you are passionate about or want to learn more about, find me on LinkedIn and Twitter and let me know. We'd like to create this series together with you, our audience. That was it for today. Thank you again, Dr. Varsha Jain and Dr. Virginia Watring. Thanks for everyone that joined us from around the globe. Have a great day ahead and see you next time. Thank you so much for the invitation, Jules. Thank Thanks, Marcia. Thanks, Jules. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.